Last week, we started a class on the providence of God. We looked at many introductory things. Uh, we looked at a Greek word that translates providence, um, one as provision and one as uh, one, once in the New Testament as provision and another time as foresight. Uh, we've defined providence as God's maintenance of the functional balance of the natural world, the fulfillment of the divine purpose, and the regulation of eternal affairs, and a special operation in the lives of those who seek to do His will. In short, providence is God's work in the world. Uh, we looked at different worldviews, different ways that people within the religious world uh, view God and view His providence. We looked at what we believe. We looked at how God is a person. He is in control of all things and that He has promised to work within this world. And we know uh, that God does, in fact, intervene within His creation. We know that God does work within this world. Uh, and we looked at several other things. But tonight we're going to pick up where we left off uh, last week and just finish a few introductory matters. And Lord willing, this won't take as long. And then we'll jump into uh, the goals of providence the goals of God's work in the world, uh, which is a very practical subject. So we started last week, or we, we mentioned this, we talked about uh, there's our, there are two kinds of providence. There are two kinds of divine providence. One is general providence, and, and general providence is God's continued care for His entire creation. God not only cares for humanity, God only, not only cares for you and your family and His children and the human race, but God cares for His entire creation. And He intervenes in the world and, um, and, and keeps the world running. We looked at several verses that, uh, that prove that fact. And we also uh, briefly mentioned uh, the second kind of providence, uh, and that's God's special providence special providence, which is God's particular care exercised toward His faithful children. Uh, just a few verses that mention God's special providence are Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6, which states, In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. A promise of God to intervene in the life of one who acknowledges Him in all of His ways. God will make straight that person's path and work within his or her life. In Psalm 37, 23, it says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. God doesn't leave his faithful children alone. He intervenes in their life and causes their growth. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 29 through 31, it says, And you warned them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted presumptuously and did not obey your commandments, but sinned against your rules, which, if a person does them, he shall live by them. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not obey. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. God worked not only in creation, not only in the created order, but also for His people. But He respected at the same time their free will choice to rebel against Him. That's the way His providence works. He intervenes within the life of His children, within his, uh, those who submit to Him. But He also respects the choice if they, if they refuse to follow Him, if they refuse to obey Him, and if they reject Him. God's providence respects that choice um, if they uh, rebel against His will and He will not force them to, um, to, live, under his, to live under His rule. Um, so that's two, those are two kinds of providence, uh, general, general providence, God's work generally within creation, and God's special providence, God's particular care exercised toward His faithful 
children. Now I want to briefly talk about uh, the difference between providence and Bible miracles. Um, miracles, Bible miracles, are events that could not have uh, occurred naturally. Uh, I think that many people equate any wonderful thing God does in the world with a miracle, but God's providence and miraculous signs, I believe, are two different things. Uh, the definition of a biblical miracle uh, we see uh, within Scripture is miracles are events that could not have occurred naturally. Uh, we see examples of many uh, such instances within Scripture. Exodus chapter 14, verse 21 says that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. That was a Bible miracle, God parting the sea. That doesn't just happen naturally. God intervened miraculously within creation. In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 42, uh, accounts the time where Jesus heals a leper. It says, And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. Obviously, uh, not a natural occurrence that uh, the man wasn't healed by man's medicine or, or any natural cause, but a divine cause uh, was the um, origin of his healing. Um, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 13, it says, He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? He said to them, Which of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the others. So again, we see Jesus performing a miracle, something that could not be explained by natural occurrences, by natural causes. And we see many such instances within the Bible. Uh, let's look at the purpose of divine miracles, uh, events that could not have occurred naturally, but by the intervention of God within uh, the creation. Uh, miracles demonstrate, Bible miracles demonstrate conclusively that the person working the miracle had the approval of God in what he said and what he taught. In Exodus chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 8, we see an example of this um, as Moses is given uh, the ability to perform Bible miracles to confirm that he is from God, that he is God's servant. It says, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. Moses here, he's concerned about his credibility. He's, assumed, he's concerned that, that when he goes to his people and when he goes to the Egyptians, that they're not going to believe him. And this is the solution. The Lord said to him, What is, it that in your, what, what is, what is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord God, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, Put your hand inside your cloak. And, put his, and he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, Put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. One of the major purpose of miraculous signs and wonders within Scripture was to confirm that someone was sent from God, to confirm the Word of God, to confirm the Word of one being spoken that he, or that he was from God. 
In 1 Kings chapter, uh, chapter 18, verse 24, it says, And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord, Elijah says. And the God who answers by fire, He is God. And all the people answered, It is well spoken. So Elijah here was given miracles to authenticate his ministry. If I perform a miracle, something that could not happen naturally, if I cause fire to come down from heaven, if I part a Red Sea, if I cause leprosy to uh, appear on my hand and then take it away, or if I take my staff and turn it into a snake, or I heal a man's withered hand, I, uh, you, you would know that I probably have um, uh, divine uh, authority to do that. You would probably guess, hey, this guy um, is, uh, is from God. This, this person um, has the authority of God since he is performing these things not naturally witnessed, not naturally seen. In John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Uh, we see in the Gospel of John uh, that John's favorite word for miracle is sign. A sign it points to something and signifies something. So that the miracles of Jesus were for the purpose of confirming His authority before God. So. In essence, we see the purpose of divine Bible miracles. One of the primary purposes of miracles in the Bible is to confirm the Word, is to confirm the Word spoken as from uh, God. Um, and we're not going to get into this uh, because I want to stay focused on, on other things, uh, but I believe, today, I believe that God works in the world today uh, not by these Bible miracles um, that we've read, but rather by His providence. And providence is the activity of God as accomplished through natural law. When we say that God doesn't uh, work through divine miracles today, we're not saying for one minute that God doesn't work. God works in the world um, and he does mighty wonders all kinds of amazing wonderful things but I believe that those things are through natural law rather than uh, supernatural occurrences um, okay so with that being said let's talk about the goals of providence uh, this is extremely important um, practically uh, and you may not see it at first, um, and I don't want, I hope I don't sound too technical or whatever, uh, but um, you'll see as we get to the end of this, and we may not be able to finish, we won't be able to finish tonight, uh, we'll finish this up next week, um, but you'll see as we go through the, there's two major goals of God's providence, of God's working in the world, and you'll see that they have a um, an enormous practical application for us in our lives today. The two reasons, the two major reasons why God um, works and intervenes within the world um, have um, overwhelming significance for me in my life. Uh, so that being said, stick with me. Um, and one, one major purpose, and I would say the primary purpose of God's providence, of God's working in the world, is that God's glory be manifested in creation. The word manifested is a revealing. It's making known. One of the primary functions of God's work in the world is so that His glory, His intrinsic value and worth may be known throughout the entire creation, throughout the entire cosmos. I would argue that that is the primary function, the primary goal, the primary purpose of God's work in the world. I've heard several pre preachers, when, when they do classes and sermons about God's providence, say that 
God's providence, God, God's providence is, um, the goal of God's providence is getting people to heaven um, so that all people may get, go to heaven and be with him. I'm not saying that that's wrong. That's, uh, that's right. Uh, that the, one of the major goals of God's working in the world is so that all people may know him and that all people may enjoy a relationship with him forever. But I believe that through study of Scripture, we see that the primary goal, rather, and this goes along with that, the primary goal is for God's glory, for God's holiness, for God's righteousness to be seen as it is, as it fully is in reality in the entire world. Uh, let's look at some verses, and I'll show you what I mean. Uh, we see that the Bible teaches uh, clearly God created all things. God created all things in heaven, on earth, all the amazing creation that you see around you and the human race. God created all things for God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. The text says, for whom, for whom are all things. We sing the song, this is my father's world. It's not my world. It was not created just for me. I am not the center of the universe. This grand drama of uh, God's work in the world, uh, the scheme of redemption, everything that God does is a production by God and for God, so that His glory may be manifested over the creation. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. All things, the text says, were created by God, through God, and for God. Everything that you see around you was created by God's omnipotence, by His, by His power, by His divine power, and they were created for Him, that His intrinsic value and worth may be known among His creation and manifested among the human race. All things were created for God. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For it was fitting that he, for whom, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Everything, everything, the text says, all things within creation were made for God. Romans chapter 11, verse 36. Now, this is from the, uh, the New Living Translation. I thought this was an interesting way to translate this passage. Uh, oh, and keep in mind that Romans 11, uh, verse 36, right, the, the whole book of Romans, the first, chap the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans are, uh, are Paul's um, most uh, extensive theological work. Um, Paul goes into um, rich, dense theology about, about the gospel uh, and about Jesus Christ in the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And then we see in the latter part of the book, beginning with chapter 12, the rest of the book of Romans, it gets more into practical application, uh, how to live uh, practically within the Christian life. Uh, and it's interesting that this, the last verse of Paul's theological discourse uh, within the first 11 chapters of Romans says this, For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Paul concludes his... Uh, his, his um, overwhelming um, grand picture of, of the gospel uh, by saying that all things, all of these things, 
um, just previously discussed are intended for his glory, that his, that his worth and value may be, may be known among his creation. And then lastly, in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's God's plan. God's plan is to fill the earth with the knowledge of His glory. God created all things, uh, not, for, not for me, not for creation, but for Him, and that His glory may be known. Now, I want to look at several examples uh, within, especially the Old Testament and also the New Testament, of how God is so zealous for His name. This may be something that we don't think about often or maybe something we, we skip over, and, and that's okay. Um, but I just want to show how pervasive this theme is in the Bible. Everything God does is for His glory. God is concerned tremendously about His glory being known and manifested within creation uh, and, and that people may, may know how worthy He is. God is extremely concerned with that within the entirety of creation or the, the entirety of uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, just one example. I, I have, I, I have a list of um, 27 verses here, uh, and I'm going to spare you from that. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these. I'm just going to pick out a few. Um, I thought you might appreciate that. But if you uh, would like to see um, how uh, how deep this theme is of God being zealous for His name and wanting His name and glory to be known, uh, come up and talk to me or send me a text to your email address and I'll send, you, um, I'll send you this outline. But I'll just look at a few here. I didn't put it on the screen because there are just too many of them. Um, Isaiah chapter 49, uh, verse 3, if you'd like to turn with me there. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 3. It says, And he said to me, You are my servant, Israel, in, who, in whom I will be glorified. So God called Israel. God uh, chose Israel and, and created this nation. God, uh, God called Israel for his glory. For his glory, so that his worth may be manifested throughout the creation. The calling and election of the nation of Israel was not just for Israel, but for God. Uh, turn with me to Psalm 106, verse 7 through 8. Psalm 106, verse 7 through 8. Psalm 106, verses 7 through 8 says, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. So this text says, as we've just read, that God rescued Israel from Egypt, uh, not just for Israel's sake, of course for Israel's sake. He loved and he cared for Israel like a father cares for his son or a mother cares for her daughter. But uh, God rescued Israel uh, from, from Egypt um, and overshadowed them, overcovered them with grace for his glory so that they may know his worth the primary motivation and intention of doing so. In Romans chapter, um, well, we won't read that one. But Romans chapter 9 verse 17 essentially says, God raised Pharaoh up to show his glory. God raised Pharaoh up, the king of Egypt, uh, for his own glory. Exodus chapter 14 verse 4 uh, says that God defeated Pharaoh at the Red Sea to show his glory. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 14 says God spared Israel in the wilderness. God didn't just 
kill Israel after their rebellion um, against him, he spared Israel for his glory and for his name's sake. Um, let's see. 2 Samuel 7, 23 uh, makes mention of God, that God gave Israel victory in Canaan for the glory of uh, so that his glory may be manifested in the earth, the glory of his name. Um, he caused Israel's victory, and, and, and he, um, he, he helped them uh, immensely and, and because, um, so that his glory may be manifested in the earth. Uh, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. I do want to read this one. 1 Samuel chapter 12. Verse 20 through 22. 1 Samuel 12, 20 through 22 says, And Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. You have done all this. Uh, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Uh, so again, God did not cast away his people. Uh, God rescued his people, saved his people, and forgave his people for his name's sake, so that his glory may be known. In 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 34, and then again in chapter 20, verse 6, it says that God saved Jerusalem from attack for the glory of his name. So that all of the enemies of God would know how worthy, how powerful and wonderful this God is. Um, Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 22 through 23 makes mention that God restored Israel from exile for the glory of his name. He brought his, uh, he, he brought his people, his chosen people, out from Babylonian captivity and back into their land, uh, not just for their sake, but primarily for his name's sake, so that they might know his glory, so that they might know his worth. In John chapter 7 verse 18 uh, it talks about how Jesus sought the glory of his father in all that he did. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 12 it talks about how Jesus told us to do good works so that God gets glory. In John chapter 5 verse 44 it talks about how Jesus told us to do good works so that God gets glory. Um, so that God gets glory. Let's see, I wrote that down, down twice. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 13, talks about how Jesus said that he answers prayer that God would be glorified. Uh, John chapter 12, verses 27 through 28, talks about how Jesus endured his final hours of suffering for God's glory. In Romans chapter 3, verse 25, through 26, it talks about how God gave His Son to vindicate the glory of His righteousness. Isaiah 43, verse 25, talks about how God forgives our sins for His own sake. God gives us mercy and grace and offers us repentance, not primarily, not just for our sake alone, but so that His glory may be known in the entire earth. Romans 15, 7, Jesus receives us into his fellowship for the glory of God. Um, let me skip down a few of these. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, God instructs us to do everything for his glory so that he may be made known within the earth. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11 talks about how God tells us to serve in a way that will glorify Him, will bring Him glory. Philippians 1, 9 talks about how Jesus will fill us with fruits of righteousness for God's glory. 
Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, all are under judgment for dishonoring God's glory. And then finally, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 9 through 10, Jesus is coming again for the glory of God. Uh, so, God is zealous for His name. God uh, is zealous for His glory. God's work within the world, His providence, the primary function of it is so that His worth and value, His magnificence, every aspect of His being and how, how powerful and how all-knowing and how ever-present, all of His mighty and wonderful attributes of, of love and grace and, and mercy, God's work in the world is so that all people may see Him as He is, wonderful, amazing, and magnificent, and submit to Him in worship. We even see within the plan of salvation, God's goal in the entire scheme of redemption, the plan of salvation that was that He would be praised for His glorious grace. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. So the passage functions like this, like you see on the screen. Number one, the purpose of God's will gives rise to, number two, a plan that through Jesus Christ, three, God's elect would receive adoption as sons, with four, the ultimate goal that they would praise the glory of God's grace. And we could talk about that uh, in much more depth and, and detail, but we'll go ahead and leave it at that. God's goal in the plan of salvation, sending Jesus Christ uh, to, to reveal uh, God's, God, God's grace, uh, God's goal in all of that was so that His glorious grace may be manifested, may be known within human, the human race and within the cosmos. And we know that Scripture teaches that God's grace for undeserving people, what Jesus Christ did, um, the revelation of God through Jesus Christ, God's grace for undeserving people through Jesus reveals His glory. We witness the very glory and majesty of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and His resurrection on the third day. That was the climax of human history. That was when God's overwhelming love and all of His, uh, all of his uh, moral caring attributes for humanity are fully unleashed and fully made known in the suffering of the Son, Jesus Christ, of God Himself. Um, God's grace for undeserving people, somebody like me, reveals how magnificent and how glorious He is, which was the goal from the very beginning before the foundation of the world. Uh, so we'll go ahead and stop there, but I'll just say, um, I know that was a lot, um, but just to give you a taste of the practicality of this, God's goals in working in the world God's goals of the goals of providence are intended f to be my goals as well. I am living not for myself, not for my own glory, but for the glory of God. That His worth, His intrinsic value may be manifested, revealed, and made known to the entire creation and to the entire human race. 
God's goal of his work in the world should be my goal as well. Now, wait, that's the first goal of providence. We'll talk about the second one uh, next Wednesday, Lord willing. Uh, thank you so much for your attention.